In a previous video, I had outlined a risk reversal on the SPY, and uh, I had put that risk reversal on, uh, where is it, the 22nd, somewhere around here. And it was uh, to sell a put, uh, and this is at 249 on SPY, and to use that to buy a call, and this was at 290 on the SPY. <clears throat> and I used September contracts, my average price was negative. 88 cents. In other words, I got paid to put on that risk reversal. Uh, so anything below 249, I would have to buy the ETF for 249. Anything above 290 uh, was uh, was uh, a return um, if if it finished above 290 by <clears throat> the end of September. If I held it all the way uh, to that point at that time, I had said that I was doing this because the market tends to have a long only bias. Uh, I say bias. That doesn't mean that it goes up all the time. It means it's biased to the upside because most of the money coming into the market comes into the market in long positions. The market spends the majority of its time going up. It spends a little bit of its time going down. Sure, the downdrafts can hurt, uh, but if you have a long-term horizon and if you uh, go back uh, 20 years and you look at the S&P chart, it'll It'll, it has done this, but if you draw a straight line through it to smooth it out, uh, it has uh, a general upward bias. Um, I got some pushback on that, like if everybody is long, who's selling? I didn't say everybody was long. I said large institutions tend to have a long-only bias. There are lots of hedge funds that uh, don't have a long-only bias. They can be long and short. Uh, they can be long with, uh, with uh, leverage. And especially when you have uh, hedge funds that are market neutral, in other words, they target a beta of zero, they'll use high levels of leverage. Uh, when positions turn against them, they have to delever very quickly. You can imagine having five times leverage and the market drops 5%, you're down, your equity is down 25%. Uh, retail investors tend to use margin uh, on the way up. When they start to feel safe, they tend to use margin and sometimes trade and invest at the extent of their margin. There's no room for error there. They're weak hands. Typically in a sell-off, retail investors are the first to go uh, because they have to meet margin calls. Uh, so they, they get hit first. Larger funds tend to get hit first, especially ones that use a lot of leverage. They're, they're the ones that really give that initial push. The large institutions that are long only uh, sometimes they sell, but for the most part, they just pull their bids. And they say, well, we're not buying anything at this point in time. And whatever their mandate is, they may have the opportunity of lowering their beta, but certainly not going to zero. Uh, so let me see if I can explain that a little bit better. Let's say that I'm uh, a company that has a pension fund. Uh, I will determine my asset allocation for that pension fund to reach some long-term return targets. And there may be 10% of that allocation uh, that I send to large cap equities and I'll hire a manager and say, you're in charge of large cap equities. Uh, it is not under the manager's purview to decide whether I should be invested or not. That's my decision. Once I send that money to that long only uh, uh, large cap equity manager, it's 100% invested. They have an index that they have to track and I may give them some leeway uh, to outperform that index uh, within tight risk constraints. If the target beta on the index is one, I may say, well, you can go down to 0.9 and up to 1.1 1 .1, uh, on your beta, depending on what you're going to overweight and underweight. So if they're bullish on the market, they can move the beta up to 1.1. 1 .1. If they're bearish, they can move it down to 0.9, but make no mistake, they're still long. It is not uh, their decision to move to cash. If I want to move to cash because I'm the sponsor, I have an allocation, I know what I'm doing. I know what I want my money doing. If I want that money moved to cash, I'll communicate it to the manager that I want it moved to cash. But that manager is not free to make up their own mind about what I want done. If I feel that I'm overinvested in equities, I'll have a redemption call. I'll say to the manager, look, I need so much of this back because I'm going to reallocate it somewhere else. Uh, and that's where some selling would happen. Uh, in, in the meantime, until I get my money back and put it to work somewhere else. Uh, but for everyone selling, there's somebody buying. 
So when I say that there is a long only bias, it's because a lot of these large institutional players have an asset allocation that is designed for a long investment horizon. They're not concerned with the day-to-day -day fluctuations or even something like this. They may want to see their way through something like this uh, with just holding pat. I don't know that they would change their allocation. They may take the opportunity to rebalance. Uh, but for a lot of these funds, money is flowing in all the time. Think about a pension fund. Every two weeks when the, when, when the payroll comes out, there's an employee contribution that goes with the employer contribution, a matching contribution that goes into the pension fund. Every two weeks, money's flowing in, flowing out to the managers in the proportion uh, that it needs to be allocated. That money's got to go to work. Again, it is not the manager's uh, purview to decide what my allocation could be. If all managers decided to move to cash, at some point, I as the sponsor would find myself very overweight cash. So everybody can't make up their mind. So that's what I meant by the market has a long only bias. Not that everybody's long all the time and it only goes up. It just it spends most of its time going up. So let's review the risk reversal. I'll uh, let you know what I've done and I put in a new uh, uh, position. So I had done the risk reversal somewhere around here and at that time I thought that 2900 uh, to, uh, sorry, uh, on the S&P 500, 2490 to 25 to 2900 would be a range which is about uh, 249 to 290 on the ETF. And I thought the, uh, the market would trade within that range. Uh, uh, for a while. So, uh, you know, those strike prices were driven by forward multiples on what I thought earnings might be on a range of what earnings might be. Um, well, once I put that on uh, over the next uh, seven or eight days, I think it was nine days, the market did this uh, and it just kept going up. Uh, the day of the Fed announcement, it was up 40 points, 50 points strong in the morning. And it was at that point that I thought, well, look, this is, you know, we've gone a little too far. So my version of shorting the market is selling long positions. I don't actually short the market. I'll take my long positions and I'll just lower them. I'll take some money off the table. That's my version of going short. Because if I take money off the table and the market does pull back, I can add those positions back on. Same thing. If the market doesn't uh, uh, move down, I'm not losing on my short positions. I still have long positions that are winning. So I feel good. Maybe I could have won more had I not sold, but... You know, uh, it's better than being short the market at that time. So I don't short the market. I just sell long positions. So I sold out of my positions. I had uh, paid negative 88 cents for them. Uh, when I got out, I think I got average price of 1160. I had 15 uh, contracts that I got out of. Uh, I've said many times I'm not a short term trader. Uh, but if the market is going to hand me a big win uh, in a short period of time, I'm not a fool. I'll take it. I'll take it off the table. Uh, I was feeling before the Fed announcement that, well, I think we're a little too, too toppy. Uh, why risk it on a Fed announcement that, that may disappoint the market? Uh, sure, maybe the market would continue on. Well, that's fine. I have a bunch of long positions that would have still continued on. This was a speculative play. So uh, all the signs pointed to me saying, look, just, just take, the, uh, take the income off the table. By the way, if you um, multiply this out, and this is in U.S. dollars because this is the SPY, and then you multiply it, and I think the conversion rate that day was 139. It was low 139s. Uh, you get to about 25 to 26,000 Canadian, uh, all in the span of eight or nine days. Um, I uh, chastise people for taking their profits off the table too soon. They'll buy stock. It'll go up a few bucks, and they want to cash out. And I think, well, what are you doing? Um, so what am I doing? Why do I do this? Why did I sell out? Uh, another skill in the market is knowing when to take your profits. When the market delivers something this fast uh, in such a short period of time, take your profit. Uh, I did not anticipate a, a sell-off at all. After the Fed announcement, uh, the, I sold when the market was up about 40 points. After the Fed announcement, the market was up at one point almost 100 points. So you can imagine how I felt after the fact, saying, ah, if I would have just held on, just another hour, if I would have just waited. Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's better to regret losses you wouldn't have made than it is to regret gains you lost. So uh, in, in that respect, being that it was so in the money, I took them off. And the market pulled back. Uh, so it started pulling back. But what happened here, 
Uh, rather than putting on the 290, the 249, 290 risk reversal, I found that the volatility from this period of time to this period of time had dropped. So I couldn't get the premiums to get this wide of a, uh, a, of a margin between the upper and lower band which means I could still sell the 290 call for September, but I was walking all the way up to the 264, 265 put. Here was the 249. Well, I've got to move my put selling up. Well, that heightens the risk of doing a risk reversal. Uh, so I tried another strategy, which uh, is sort of interesting. You might want to pay attention on this one. It is a risk reversal with an extra put. So I bought a 294 call. I bought the 294 call. This is for September because I still think the market has a, an upward bias. Uh, the market may sell off and continue to sell off. And again, I think that will bounce somewhere between 2700 and 2900 on the S&P. So it still may go down. I sold the 294 call and I financed it with the 240 put. Two of them. Two times the 240 put. So two of the 240 puts paid for one of the calls, and instead of using 15 contracts, I only used eight this time, because eight times two is 1,600 shares. This last one was for 1,500 shares if it got put to me. So I'll still have the same amount put to me, but I have a zero cost long position on the S&P. Now, the nice thing about this one here, when I did the risk reversal, the uh, position delta was, uh, I forget what it was, but it was, it was, a little over 0.5 but it wasn't it wasn't like 0.8 or 0.9 uh, the position delta on this one uh, is 0.78 why because the call is slightly above where we are now the call is very close to uh, where the price is but the puts are so far out of the money the deltas on them are very low so even combining two puts I still end up with a delta on my position uh, that's fairly high so I have a nice delta on this so any rally this position will start to uh, uh, gain uh, very quickly and um, I was able to get wider bands. Now, I don't know if I'm done adding to this position or if I'll just stay with this position right now. Uh, but I was able to take the risk reversal off the table and use a combo, which is a risk reversal plus another put. Now, I could have gone even deeper and sold three puts against one call to really push that put out of the market so that, that, that the financing I'm using to pay for that call has even less probability of being put to me. Uh, then I would have resized my position. Instead of eight of those, I would have went with five. You lower your risk, you will lower your return. If you're willing to take on more risk, you'll get a higher return. So had I gone deeper, I might have even been able to get to, instead of the uh, 240 strike, I might have been able to get down to the 225 or the 220 strike and use three puts against one call. Use the puts to finance the call. This gives me uh, a zero cost long position. Actually, it's a little bit better because I don't put on eight positions right away. I put on one and then I watch the market. And if, if the market uh, becomes even more favorable for this, I put on another one. In other words, as it was dropping, I was adding to my position so that my average cost right now is negative 366 uh, per share. Negative 366. So that my break even is not 240. It's 240 minus the 366. So if by expiration, uh, the uh, S&P finishes between these blue bands. Uh, both, all the options expire worthless, but I got paid $3.66 a share uh, for eight contracts, for 800 shares. Uh, so worst case scenario, I'm still gonna uh, uh, walk out of this with, you know, if it stays in the bands, I'll still walk away with a little under 3,000 US by September. Uh, I don't expect a lot of bullishness above 2,900. I also don't expect a lot of bearishness as we get closer to 2,700, even 26. I would think that the market would turn far more bullish than bearish. I think we're in a trading channel uh, for, uh, for a while at this point. So I thought I'd update you on the risk reversal and show you an interesting way, other than using synthetic long positions or risk reversals of using a combo of using multiple puts to finance your one call on the upside. And what am I doing? I'm betting on probability. The history of the market shows that if you wanted to, to determine what's the probability of the market going up, you would look at how over how many periods did it go up versus how many periods did it go down. You're going up, if you look at it monthly, you're going up about 85, 90% of the time. 
I'll play the probabilities any day. I'll play the probabilities. You give me an 85, 90, uh, 85 to 90% probability, I'll take it. Um, and there it is. So uh, just as a uh, final slide, just to tie all of what I've said to the content, level one uh, in quant, and there's a whole reading on probability. Uh, what I quoted at the end by looking through history uh, on, the, on a monthly basis and looking at the uh, S&P 500 for the up months and down months and calculating probabilities of up versus down, that's called an empirical probability. Where we look in the historical record, we look at what something has actually done and we calculate our probabilities based on the count, number of months it went up versus the entire number of months, etc. So uh, if you're uh, at level one going through probability, wondering when are we ever going to use an empirical probability, uh, it's used a lot. Uh, the discussion I had of the pension fund and the sponsor creating the asset allocation and then hiring managers to manage each, uh, each segment, uh, portfolio management at level three, uh, institutional portfolio management, which is in book six, I think first reading of book six, there's a whole section on uh, pension funds <clears throat> and uh, the uh, strategies that I use, uh, combining another put with the risk reversal, selling two puts to buy a call. Uh, we'll find this in uh, level three option strategies, which is a reading in book three. It used to be at level two, um, but it got moved up to level three. And as you go through uh, this content, you'll find that what I've said in the video is exactly what's written on the pages. The stuff in the CFA content applies in the real world as it's written. It is, as I've said before, uh, I think one of the best aggregations of real world applied knowledge in one place. Okay, that's a wrap.